My journey through the state of Minnesota turned out to be nothing but an unforeseen deviation from my usual route. It was summer, and I was transporting a load of medicine to a neighboring state, but the navigator chose a path through this land of lakes and forests to avoid traffic jams. The road stretched between endless fields and green forests for miles around. The air was saturated with the scent of pine and freshly mown grass, and on the horizon, blue flashes of lakes flickered like mirrors reflecting the summer sky. I loved driving through Minnesota in the summer. The warmth and tranquility of these places contrasted with my usual routine. Passing by one of the lakes, I noticed several boats with fishermen gliding smoothly across the water. Minnesota is known for its lakes, and summer is the perfect time for fishing and water recreation. I even envied them a little, imagining how great it would be to stop here for at least a day, forget about the cargo and hustle, and simply enjoy the peace and quiet. One day, as I was driving past a dense forest, my navigator suddenly stopped working. Surprised, I tapped on the device, hoping to revive it, but to no avail. Assuming it was broken, I decided I would fix it once I reached the nearest town. Attempts to launch the navigator on my cell phone also proved unsuccessful. There was no signal. This seemed strange to me, but I continued on, guided only by intuition. Soon, I came to a fork in the road. With the navigator not working, I had to make a blind choice. I turned right, onto a better maintained road, hoping it would lead me to people. The forest began to thin out, giving way to open fields, and within 10 minutes, houses appeared on the horizon. As I approached, I saw a typical American town, like many I had encountered on my journey. Small houses with porches, a church, an old water tower towering over the town. However, something unsettled me. It seemed like the town lacked vitality, as if its inhabitants were indifferent to it. Lawns were untrimmed, trash lay around in places, broken swings stood alone in the playground. As soon as I drove into town, an old man on the porch of one of the houses caught my attention. He was calmly rocking in a rocking chair, smoking a pipe and gazing into the distance. His gaze briefly slid over me in surprise, but then he returned to his thoughts without any particular emotion. I parked the truck in front of his house, got out, and addressed him. Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where I can find an electronic store around here? The old man continued to smoke, pausing for a moment before responding. Finally, he took the pipe out of his mouth and said slowly, There are none in this town. I asked insistently, What town is this? And how do I get to the nearest big city? He replied, You're unlikely to reach another city anytime soon. It'll be dark soon. Wouldn't it be better for you to stop here? I shook my head. I need to keep going to which the old man simply smiled silently and continued smoking. As I got back into the car, I continued through the town, which seemed increasingly strange to me. I noticed that people on the streets would turn and look each time I drove past. Children would stop playing, pointing at me with their fingers. Soon, I managed to leave the town behind, leaving behind its mysterious streets and the stares of its inhabitants. My heart was filled with both anxiety and curiosity. What kind of town was this? And why did everyone behave as if I were the first stranger to arrive here in many years? Questions swirled in my head as I drove away from that place. But the answers, it seemed, remained somewhere there, in the shadow of the old town. Soon I found myself on a highway shrouded in forest and continued my journey trying to distract myself from the strange impressions. The forest gradually gave way to open clearings, and another small town appeared on the horizon. At first glance, the distance between the two towns seemed too short. But the closer I got to it, 
the stronger the feeling of deja vu engulfed me. These houses, this street, everything looked identical to the town I had just left. The strangest part was when I saw the same old man sitting on the porch in his rocking chair smoking his pipe. Stopping, I rubbed my eyes in bewilderment. How could I end up in the same place again? Was it a circular road? But I was driving straight. Without getting out of the car, I continued driving, passing by familiar houses and encountering the same people's stares. The feeling of discomfort grew stronger. What was happening here? Driving out of town on the only road, I found myself in the forest again, which gradually gave way to clearings. And again, the same small town appeared before me. What the hell is going on? Echoed in my head. The headache became unbearable. I decided to turn around and go back, but soon found myself in the forest again, which began to thin out revealing familiar clearings. It seemed like I had entered an endless loop, or some kind of reality show where every turn of the road returned me to the beginning. With each loop, the sense of reality began to slip away, making me doubt my own perception. Was this town real, or was it all a product of my imagination? Approaching the house where the old man sat, I stopped and got out of the car. Approaching him, I noticed that he continued to smoke his pipe carefreely, his gaze full of understanding, as if he knew the answers to all my questions even before I asked them. Sir, what is happening here? I asked, trying to hide my confusion. This time he didn't smile. Putting his pipe aside, he said seriously, You won't be able to leave this town. His words caught me off guard. What do you mean? Are you joking? What's going on? My questions poured out one after another, but the old man remained silent. You must calm down. It happens to everyone who comes here, he finally said. How am I supposed to calm down? Can you finally explain what's going on? I insisted. I don't know myself. We all end up here and can't get out, the old man confessed. His words sounded like a verdict. Why wasn't I told about this right away? I asked. Everyone must go through this on their own. Otherwise, no one would believe it, he replied. No, this is some kind of joke. I don't believe this is really happening, I said, and returned to my car. Driving out of town, I soon found myself back in it. Refusing to give up, I stopped near the forest and decided to continue on foot. After walking through the forest for about 20 minutes, I returned to my truck again. What the hell? I thought, overcome with fear and growing panic. As dusk began to fall, I sat in my truck and headed back to town. The old man still sat in his rocking chair, peacefully smoking his pipe, and his carefree demeanor sparked a surge of anger in me. Stopping the car, I jumped out and grabbed him by the collar. This is no joke anymore, old man. Tell me what's going on, I shouted into his impassive face. In response, he just smiled and looked down the street. It will be dark soon. We need to go inside, he said calmly. Why? I let go of him, then ushered the old man back into his chair. Danger comes to this town at night, and your life may be in danger. That's why I strongly advise you to come with me to safety, he continued. These words provoked even greater anger in me. What is this madman talking about? I thought, giving him one last look, and returned to my car to continue on the same route, refusing to give in to the face of the inexplicable. As I drove through the town, I noticed how all its residents hurried back to their homes. It seemed strange to me but I didn't pay much attention and continued driving. When I found myself in the town again, darkness fell and despair engulfed me. Stopping the car, I began to contemplate my situation, wondering how I ended up here and whether this was really happening to me in reality. Immersed in my thoughts, I suddenly heard a noise outside. 
Looking around, I didn't see anything unusual. The streetlights weren't on and the windows in the houses were boarded up. Then I heard a loud crash from another direction, as if a metal lid from a trash can had fallen to the ground. It scared me. I remembered the old man's words. Perhaps he wasn't lying. Suddenly there was a loud rumble, and a huge creature with red eyes landed on the hood of my truck, snarling at me. Its fur was ruffled, saliva dripping from its huge, sharp fangs. Its claws pierced the metal of the hood, and it glared at me menacingly. The creature before me resembled the werewolves from movies. Damn it, it really was a freaking werewolf. I was paralyzed with shock, unable to believe my eyes. Suddenly the creature leaped, smashing into the windshield of my truck, its paw breaking through the glass, trying to reach me. Recoiling, I tried to dodge its claw. The glass was almost shattered, and I decided it was time to run. Grabbing the door handle, I dashed out onto the street, circling around the truck, when suddenly another creature leaped out from behind it. It glared at me maliciously, preparing to pounce. In desperation, I threw myself to the ground and slipped under the trailer, soon finding myself on the other side. Glancing back, I saw the werewolf crawling after me. Then I looked at the cab and noticed another creature emerging from it. My heart pounded in unison with my rapid breaths. I needed to make a decision quickly, and I decided to run. Jumping to my feet, I ran as fast as I could. It was dark, but the moon illuminated my path with bright light. I ran without looking back, cursing the moment I turned into this damn town. I headed towards the nearest house, banging on the door with desperate hope for salvation. But there was no answer. Without wasting time, I continued to run, realizing that the creatures were already too close. Another house didn't open either. My heart pounded in unison with my steps as I ran along the dark road. Suddenly, one of the creatures leaped in front of me with a menacing growl. Turning to run in another direction, I found my path blocked by another one. And immediately, from the other side of the road, a third one leaped out. Surrounded, I thought it was the end for me. They glared at me maliciously as if deliberating my fate already preparing to pounce. But then, as if by some stroke of luck, the door of the house next to me suddenly swung open, and a woman appeared in the doorway. She waved her hand and shouted, urging me to run to her. Without hesitation, I dashed towards the open door. The creatures followed me, but seemed to encounter an invisible barrier at the threshold of the house. I fell to the floor in the hallway, breathing heavily and trying to gather my thoughts. The woman quickly slammed the door behind me and turned the key in the lock. I was still lying on the floor, feeling the fear gradually recede, giving way to relief. Approaching me, she extended her hand and helped me to my feet. Her gaze was full of sympathy and understanding, as if she knew what I had been through to end up here. As I stood up, I was able to take a closer look at her. Before me stood a middle-aged woman with warm eyes and a gentle smile. Her chestnut hair was neatly styled, and her clothing was simple but well-kept. "'How are you?' she asked. "'You miraculously survived. Thank God you managed to reach the door. My name is Mary.' Still in shock and fear, I offered her my trembling hand and introduced myself. My name is John. She looked at me with a concerned expression and said, You've been through a lot. Let's go to the kitchen. I'll make you some coffee. Agreeing, though my mind was swirling with a million questions, I followed her. The kitchen was small, the furniture was not new, but it was clear that it was cared for. In the center of the kitchen was a table and four chairs, Along the walls were cabinets with dishes and a sink. I didn't notice a refrigerator, and as I understood, there was no electricity in this town. The light came from candles. Mary offered me to sit at the table and I gladly accepted. Then she went to brew some coffee. 
All this time, my thoughts revolved around the incredible events of the past few hours and the strange town I somehow ended up in. I hoped that she would be able to provide me with answers to some of my questions. Mary placed a small kettle on the stove with a chimney, and soon it started boiling. She added a spoonful of coffee and a little sugar to the cup, then poured boiling water over it. Handing me the hot drink, she mentioned that it was the last supply of coffee. Thanking her embarrassedly, I heard her explaining that the last person who came to their town brought a batch of coffee, which made everyone incredibly happy, but the supply quickly ran out. After sipping some coffee, which seemed bitter to me, I asked the first question that had been bothering me. What were those creatures? Mary just shrugged. We don't know ourselves. They come every night, but we remain safe inside our homes, she said. So, you have no idea what happens every night? I clarified. Yes, it's just a fact we have to accept. We can't change it. Fighting them is pointless, as you can't leave the town anyway, she continued. And yes, you've seen those creatures. What can you do with them? One swipe of their paw and you're dead. Her words filled me with even more concern and, at the same time, brought about disapproval. Were the residents of this town really so defenseless in the face of such a threat? And was there really no way to deal with it, or at least try to leave this town? My mind was filled with questions, hoping to find answers. Have you really not tried to leave this town? I asked, astonished. Of course we've tried, but it's impossible. We've tried everything. Usually, newcomers always try to find a way out, but they quickly give up, Mary replied with a hint of regret in her voice. How long have you been in this town? I asked. It's been three years already. We came to this town three years ago. Her words were heavy. Were you alone? I inquired, anticipating the answer. Yes, it was me and my daughter. She was five years old at the time, she shared. I see, I said, finishing my tea. Well, I think you can stay with me for now. I have a spare room. We'll leave all other questions for tomorrow. For now, just lie down and rest, Mary suggested. Reluctantly agreeing, she led me upstairs to her house, where there was a small room with a bed. I thanked her and lay down, but I couldn't sleep that night. Thoughts about what was happening in this town and about the mysterious creatures that hunted here at night circled in my head, giving me no peace. Early in the morning I got up and went downstairs, where I saw Mary's family already gathered for breakfast. Sitting next to the woman was a girl about eight years old with curly black hair. She looked at me with surprise, then turned her gaze to her mother. Mary introduced me. Meet Uncle John. He came to us yesterday. The girl curiously looked me over and continued to eat her breakfast. Mary invited me to join them, and I took a chair at the table, where I was offered breakfast of boiled mushrooms and vegetables. I noticed that there were many mushroom dishes on the table. I tried them and they seemed all right. After breakfast, she took me outside where the locals had already started their morning activities. I was curious about what they were doing. They seemed calm, even though monsters roamed here every night, but apparently people get used to everything. Where are we going? I asked. To the elder. He'll help you find work, Mary replied. Surprised, I asked again, work? What do you do here? To survive, everyone contributes. We have a sort of commune here. We share everything with each other. Some grow vegetables, some take care of animals. I gather mushrooms, she explained. Mushrooms, I clarified. Yes, surprisingly they grow abundantly here, and I collect them, dry them, and preserve them, Mary continued. Soon we reached the town center, and along the way people cast glances at us, probably guessing who the newcomer was. 
When we approached the elder's house, I saw a building that clearly stood out from the rest. It was an ancient two-story house with wide steps leading to a heavy wooden door adorned with carvings. The walls of the house were made of stone, giving it a sense of enduring strength and reliability. Around the house, there was a neatly trimmed lawn with old trees here and there, providing pleasant shade and coolness even on the hottest day. The roof of the house was covered with dark red tiles, which gave the building a special charm. The windows on the first floor were large, allowing plenty of light inside, while the windows on the second floor were smaller, adding an element of mystery to the building. Next to the entrance stood an antique lantern, which, as it seemed to me, was lit in the evenings, illuminating the path to the door. On the porch, the town elder was already waiting for us, the same old man I had seen in the rocking chair. He looked at me with a friendly gaze and introduced himself. Hello, my name is Harold. Sorry for our not very pleasant meeting yesterday. I also introduced myself, and the old man continued. Mary probably already told you that there's no way out of this town. But that doesn't mean we should stop living. We must fight, and one day we'll find a way out. But for now, we must focus on surviving. Every resident, by living here and benefiting from the common goods, must contribute to the common cause. And if you don't mind, I'll direct you to Mary for work collecting mushrooms. I pondered for a moment and decided it wasn't a bad idea, so I responded positively. Seeing my agreement, the old man asked, and also I want to know, what cargo were you carrying? As you know, we're poorly provided for and it could be very useful. Finding out that I was carrying medicines, Harold and Mary were delighted. It turned out that Mary was a doctor and she needed medications for one of the patients. The three of us headed towards my truck, which was already surrounded by local residents, curious about what I had brought. I opened the trailer and they started actively unloading the boxes of medicines. They carefully carried them to the local infirmary, located nearby. Mary, taking on the role of coordinator, pointed out where each box should be taken. Her face was glowing with excitement from such an unexpected gift of fate. As for me, having already resigned myself to my current fate, I didn't worry about the safety of the cargo. The understanding that the customer wouldn't receive it didn't seem so important to me anymore. Perhaps I would indeed stay here forever. Reflecting on my situation, I headed back to the truck's cabin and discovered traces of yesterday's events, which reminded me that everything that had happened was not a dream. The windshield of my truck was shattered, the cabin was in chaos, and claw marks from that creature were visible on the hood. Examining the damage, I realized that if I cleared away the remnants of the windshield, the truck could still be used to move around the town. As I waited for the unloading of the medicines, which took about two hours, I witnessed Mary's tireless work. She was fully immersed in the process of sorting medications and providing assistance to those in need, leaving no room for other concerns. Deciding not to waste time, I decided to explore the town. Despite warnings that leaving it was impossible, inside me still burned the hope of returning to my loved ones waiting for me beyond its limits. As I wandered through the town, I tried to find something unusual or a clue that could indicate a way out. However, the town appeared quite ordinary to me, except for its closed structure. The center of the town turned out to be the Elder's House, located right in the heart of the settlement. Other streets radiated from it, creating a radial structure. The main street, which I had already traveled, divided the town in half, providing access to the main facilities and buildings. All this reminded me of a well-planned but at the same time closed space, created in such a way that its inhabitants could easily navigate within it without leaving its boundaries. Although I found no clues about a possible way to freedom, 
this inspection gave me a better understanding of the organization of the town's life and its inhabitants, who, despite all the difficulties, tried to support each other and maintain hope. While strolling through the town, I also noticed an interesting detail. On the doors of each house was painted a sun symbol with straight rays, inside of which was an octagon, and in its center was an eye. This symbol instantly caught my attention, raising many questions about its meaning and origin. I became curious whether this symbol could serve as protection against the creatures, preventing them from entering the houses. The symbol seemed ancient and mysterious, and I set out to learn more about its history and significance. Considering everything that had happened in the last few days, it seemed quite likely that such symbols helped the local residents maintain relative safety at night. Intuitively, I understood that behind this sign lay a deep meaning, the roots of which go back to ancient times and cultures, possibly knowing the secrets of combating dark forces. Deciding that in the evening I would definitely ask Mary about this symbol, I continued my reflections on how centuries-old knowledge and traditions help people survive in conditions where modern technologies and knowledge prove powerless. As the day approached evening, I returned to Mary's house, where she was already preparing dinner. In addition to the hostess and her daughter, there were two more people in the house, a man about 40 years old and a young woman of 25. They were called Thomas and Sarah, Mary's friends. Thomas was of sturdy build, with deep wise eyes and gray hair, giving him the appearance of a knowledgeable man of life. Sarah, on the other hand, was light and lively, with bright eyes and an open smile. Her appearance exuded boldness and optimism. Our acquaintance began over dinner. Thomas and Sarah asked about the latest news in the country, curious about the world beyond their town. After answering their questions, I decided to find out how long they had been here. Sarah replied that it had been five years, and Thomas, twenty. He shared the story of how he ended up here on his motorcycle, encountering a fork in the road that unexpectedly led him to this town. He was a little younger then. At the entrance, I met an old man who turned out to be the elder, Thomas recounted. Surprised that his story matched mine, I asked if the elder was the same then as he is now. Thomas confirmed, Yes, by the way, he's hardly changed at all. I got so used to him that I didn't even notice. He taught me a lot and helped me survive here. I pondered over it. This old man had been suspicious from the very beginning, and how the locals hadn't noticed it. Perhaps it was all because of the image of a noble and kind old man. Could he deceive people and hide something? Suddenly we heard a commotion outside. I was frightened. It was those creatures. Apparently their time had come. I looked at my companions. They were quite calm, I would even say carefree. And I wondered if this carelessness could lead to trouble. After pondering for a while, I asked them how long ago there had been victims because of these creatures. Thomas paused, unable to remember, and the others also scratched their heads. So, there were no victims at all? I asked perplexedly. How is that possible, considering how incredibly dangerous these creatures are? Wait, I remembered, said Thomas. It was about 17 years ago, Kevin's mother. She worked as a cleaner in the elder's house. I remember how she died because of those creatures. I personally saw her body. I was returning from the field and heard a terrible scream and crying. When I ran there, I saw Kevin. He was about five years old then, sitting over his mother's body, crying his heart out. After that incident, he had some trouble with his head. I saw the body of the poor woman and was terribly frightened. She had bite marks all over her, flesh torn beyond recognition. That image haunted me in nightmares for a long time. Wait, so you were coming back from work, which means it was still light. How could they attack then, if they only come out at night? I asked. I also thought about it, 
but there were no witnesses except her son, so I can't say for sure what happened, replied Thomas. So you're saying she worked in the elder's house? Yes, wait. You don't suspect him. He definitely couldn't be involved in this. He sincerely cares about each of us and maybe there were no victims because of him. I had nothing to reply to that. But this old man was extremely suspicious. And you didn't have to be Sherlock to understand that. I decided to stand up and peek out the window, even though it was nailed shut. Apparently they left a gap here specifically to survey the surroundings. It was dark outside, but suddenly I saw a silhouette walking along the alley, looking around. Only the gait of this creature alone was terrifying. I stared at it when suddenly it turned around and our gazes met. In fright, I recoiled from the window. Damn, this is really scary. We sat a little longer and then went to sleep. Thomas walked into my room while Sarah lay down in the living room. The next morning, we had breakfast and went out onto the porch, where the sun symbol adorned the door. I pointed it out to Thomas, who replied, Oh, this, yes, this symbol serves as protection against those creatures. We paint it on new houses and make sure it doesn't wear off on old ones. Otherwise, trouble will follow. Where it came from is unknown to me. It has always been here. I listened to him and realized that my conclusions were correct. I wanted to decipher the meaning of these symbols. Soon, Mary came out, and we headed to the local infirmary, which was a small, cozy house located on the outskirts of the town. The building was made of dark wood, weathered over time, which gave it a special charm. There was a small shingled roof on top, and around the house was a small garden where medicinal herbs and flowers grew. Inside the infirmary, there were only a few beds, creating a feeling of homely comfort. On one of the beds lay an elderly woman, next to whom were the elder Harold and, apparently, this woman's son. They were talking about something, and it was clear that the son was grateful to the elder for the help rendered. Harold smiled sympathetically, patting the man on the shoulder in a sign of support. It seemed I was beginning to understand how he gained high support among the locals. Mary approached the patient's bed and professionally administered an injection, then carefully gave the necessary medications. It was evident that she was well versed in medicine and cared for her patients with great love and attention. After Mary finished her procedures and made sure the patient was okay, we left the infirmary. We headed to the center for mushroom gathering, which turned out to be a simple but spacious warehouse. Here, they sorted and dried the gathered mushrooms, which, as I understood, played a key role in the diet of the townspeople. In conditions of limited access to external resources and the absence of imports from outside, except for rare cases like my arrival, mushrooms became not just food, but a valuable source of sustenance. At the warehouse, Mary and I took baskets and small knives for mushroom picking, preparing for the upcoming work. There were many shelves around the warehouse with various types of mushrooms neatly arranged for drying. The aroma of dried mushrooms filled the air, creating a sense of coziness and warmth. To my surprise, Mary and I didn't head into the deep forest for mushrooms, but started looking for them right in the town, going around houses and strolling through the lawns. Around the houses, in open spaces, we found many of the mushrooms we were looking for. Mary showed me how to properly pick them. The process turned out to be straightforward, but I was amazed by the abundance of mushrooms right in the town. When I asked where so many mushrooms came from here, Mary replied that she didn't know herself, but they had been a lifesaver for the first people who arrived here. While we were working, I asked if there was a place here where the history of this town was kept. Mary said that all records were kept in the archive of the town hall, where settlers left descriptions of their lives here. I asked her to take me there later, and she agreed. Continuing to gather mushrooms, I discovered an interesting feature. 
trying to pick a mushroom, I noticed that its stem stretched in a certain direction. This made me wonder, and I began to observe the arrangement of the mushrooms more closely. Regardless of their location, all the mushroom stems pointed in one direction, towards the center of the town. This discovery seemed mysterious to me, and I decided to make a note of it for myself. After filling our baskets, Mary and I returned to the warehouse, where we carefully laid out the harvest for further sorting. After selecting the best specimens, we left them to dry. The work was done, and as Mary noted, it was time to attend to our own affairs. She needed to visit some of the sick. Taking advantage of the moment, I asked Mary to take me to the archive, wanting to learn more about the history of this place. Ten minutes later, we were already there. The archive building stood out with its old-fashioned architecture among the other buildings in the town. It was a massive two-story structure with heavy wooden doors and narrow windows, through which only scant light penetrated. The facade was adorned with carved elements, giving it a special historical flavor. Entering inside, I found a room completely furnished with cabinets filled with folders of documents. The absence of a guardian allowed me to freely peruse the archives. The room exuded an atmosphere of secluded scholarship, and every cabinet and folder contained particles of this place's past. The air was filled with the scent of old paper and musk, adding to the mystery of what was happening. Browsing through the dusty pages of the past, I came across the history of the founding of the town, which was discovered by the first settler, Kevin Horton, in 1875. He was a soldier who was sent on a mission, and Kevin stumbled upon this place while wandering on horseback. Unable to find his way back, he built a house here, laying the foundation for the future settlement. Since then, as the record stated, other people continued to fall into the trap here. These records told of their lives and deaths, how they learned to survive, feeding on local mushrooms, which apparently played a key role in their diet. Among other things, the archives mentioned the same symbols on the doors of each house, but there were no exact details about the origin of these signs, as if they had always been part of this place. Also, the documents mentioned the nocturnal monsters, but there was no information about ways to protect against them, or about victims among the settlers. This only added to the mystery and enigma surrounding the town and its inhabitants. Immersed in reading, I didn't notice someone approaching me from behind. A cough made me turn around. It was Elder Harold, who looked at me with interest and asked if I had found anything useful. Sharing some of my conclusions with him, I heard his reminder that evening was approaching, and it was time to return home. Thanking him and preparing to leave, I caught a glimpse of him giving me a sinister look. What could that mean? Returning to the house, where Mary and her daughter were already waiting for me, we sat down to dinner. The evening passed in pleasant conversation, after which I expressed gratitude for the warm welcome and went up to my room. It was time to ponder over all the information I had gathered during the day. First and foremost, the behavior of Elder Harold alarmed me. His unusually friendly demeanor suddenly turned into a sinister glance when I began asking questions about the town. The fact that he hadn't changed in the last 20 years also raised suspicions. Could this indicate his involvement in the town's unusual events? Secondly, I was intrigued by the story of the young boy named Kevin's mother. Rumors that she worked for the Elder and may have learned something important could explain her gruesome death. Thirdly, the mysterious mushrooms, all of whose mycelia led to the center of the town, could not have been a coincidence. This confirmed my suspicions that the center of the town might hold the key to unraveling its mysteries. Tomorrow, I have two important tasks ahead of me to test my conclusions. To approach the elder's house and see if the mycelia lead straight to his house, 
which could indicate his connection to these unusual phenomena. And secondly, to find Kevin, who may know much more about the town than it seems at first glance. Lying on the bed and lost in my thoughts, I didn't notice how complete darkness fell outside the window. Suddenly, the creak of the doors downstairs on the first floor caught my attention. Instantly alert, I thought it might be Mary, but it seemed to me that someone had opened the front door. The question arose, who could come in or out at this time? Excitement gripped me. Carefully getting up from the bed, I crept to the staircase and cautiously peeked downstairs. To my horror, I saw that one of those nocturnal creatures had managed to enter the house. Not understanding how this could happen, considering the protective symbols on the doors, I hurried to Mary's room to warn her about the unexpected guest. Quietly knocking and receiving no response, I gently pushed the door, discovering that it was unlocked. In Mary and her daughter's room, they were fast asleep on the bed. Approaching closer, I gently woke Mary up. She startled, looking at me with fear. Putting a finger to my lips as a sign to be quiet, I whispered that we were in danger and needed to leave immediately. Mary quickly regained her composure, understanding the seriousness of the situation. Peeking into the corridor cautiously, I saw that the creature had already made its way to the second floor and was making its way to my room. Once it disappeared from view inside, Mary, her daughter and I quietly made our way to the staircase and started descending to the first floor. But suddenly, one of the steps creaked loudly under my foot. Looking back, I saw the werewolf hearing the sound, rushing out of my room and heading straight towards us. I shouted to Mary that we needed to run. Grabbing her daughter in my arms, we rushed towards the exit, and behind us, a terrifying roar echoed. Mary pointed in the direction of Thomas's house, and we continued running there. But suddenly, I heard Mary fall behind me. Turning around, I saw the creature approaching her. I turned around, quickly helped her up, and handed her the daughter. The creature kept approaching, and then I, spreading my arms, shouted back, trying to resist it. The werewolf stopped a meter away from me, began to snarl, but did not take any further action. We stood facing each other, exchanging glances. Gradually backing away, I headed towards Thomas's house. Once I was near the house, I quickly entered through the open door. Thomas, hearing the noise, rushed to the door and closed it behind me, thus ensuring our safety. Inside the house, there was silence, interrupted only by our heavy breathing after the run. In my mind, I pondered how this creature could have penetrated Mary's house despite all precautions. I also tried to make sense of my theory that these creatures cannot harm humans, or rather not always, and this theory was confirmed. Thomas, learning about what had happened, was also shocked. We decided not to take any risks and stayed with him until morning. When it started getting light outside and the first rays of the sun illuminated the town, we went back to Mary's house together. Approaching, I was horrified to discover that the sign on the front door, presumably protecting the house from nocturnal creatures, had been erased. That's the explanation of how the creature managed to get inside. This incident left us at a loss, and we stood discussing what could have happened and who could be behind it. Soon, other townspeople arrived at the scene. With joint efforts, we quickly restored the sign on the door, returning the house to its previous protection. The elder and the residents discussed the need to strengthen security and take additional precautions to prevent such incidents from happening again. After everyone went about their business, I asked Mary to work for me, while I decided to go in search of that strange boy, Kevin. According to Mary, he often visited the main square of the town, so I easily found the direction and soon arrived there. And indeed, in the square, I noticed a man in his thirties who seemed absorbed in his thoughts, aimlessly wandering around and muttering something to himself. His behavior and his gaze 
constantly shifting from the ground to the surrounding space, spoke of his inner turmoil or confusion. When I approached him and called him by name, Kevin flinched and momentarily stopped, as if trying to understand where his name was coming from. At my request to tell me something about his mother, his fear only intensified, and he began to repeat the same words. Don't go to the basement, Kevin, don't go to the basement. Under the impression of Kevin's words and with a new theory in my mind, I headed towards the town center where the elder's house was located. Approaching the house, I carefully looked around to make sure no one saw me, and then stealthily approached closer, beginning to inspect the lawn around the house. And there, my attention was drawn to mushrooms growing right here, on the lawn. Their mycelium resembled small cables, which, like arrow pointers, stretched straight to the elder's house. This discovery made me freeze with surprise and excitement at the same time. All this time, my observations of the mycelium leading to the town center were confirmed. They indeed pointed to the elder's house. Deciding not to waste a minute, I approached the elder's house and, to my surprise, found that the front door was unlocked. Inside the house there was silence, but my intuition told me that I was not alone. Taking a deep breath, I quietly opened the door and entered. Looking around and trying not to make any unnecessary noise, I began to search for the door to the basement. After a brief inspection, I noticed a suspicious door hidden in the shadows in a secluded corner of the house. My hand trembled as I touched the handle, but like the front door, it turned out to be unlocked. Today, I'm really lucky, I thought, feeling a mixture of excitement and anxiety. Opening the door, I saw before me a narrow staircase descending into the deep darkness of the basement. With each step downwards, the air became colder and the silence became more deafening. I descended the stairs, finding myself in a space saturated with mold and staleness, indicating the long inactivity of this place. As I progressed forward, my eyes gradually adjusted to the darkness, and I began to distinguish the outlines of objects in the basement. In the darkness, I managed to find another door, and I pulled the handle. Entering through the secret door, I found myself in a space resembling a cave, illuminated by glowing stones embedded in the ceiling. The light from the stones created a faintly flickering atmosphere, making the walls of the cave come alive with various shades of light. As I moved deeper into the cave, I stumbled upon a sight that made my heart skip a beat. In the center lay something resembling a huge brain, from which numerous thin tendrils branched out, penetrating into the cave walls like antennae. The brain itself was semi-transparent and emitted pulsating light, changing colors from green to yellow, then to red, creating a hypnotic spectacle. Next to this brain were cocoons, inside of which, upon closer inspection, I discovered werewolves. Apparently, these cocoons served as makeshift incubators or resting places for them. This discovery shocked me, but it also shed light on the connection between the brain the core, and the werewolves attacking the town at night. Realizing that the werewolves were guarding the core and any attempt to approach it could result in catastrophe, I decided that it would be wiser to retreat and carefully consider our next steps. The importance of the moment required caution and strategy as direct confrontation without preparation was too risky. Thus, I cautiously left the cave trying not to make any unnecessary noise or attract attention. My caution paid off. On the way back, I didn't encounter anyone, allowing me to safely return to the surface. After that, I headed home. I would like to discuss this information with someone, which, to be honest, was shocking. When I came home, there was no one there, and I had to wait for Mary to return. She returned closer to evening, while it was still light outside. I asked her to stay alone and told her about what I saw. With her mouth agape, 
She listened to my story, hardly believing what was happening. Our discussion lasted for several hours, and in the end, we developed a plan. First, we needed to figure out how to destroy this strange brain, which was undoubtedly the culprit of our imprisonment. Secondly, we needed to figure out how to do it discreetly and bypass those very werewolves. We contemplated and decided that the most effective way to destroy the core would be to inject a special solution. Mary and I started experimenting. Deciding to start with the mycelium, which, as we assumed, was connected to the core and could serve as its parts or feeding channels, we went to the infirmary for the necessary medications. Mary, being a doctor, took responsibility for selecting and preparing the substance. She found several types of medications in the infirmary that could affect the organic structure of the core. After several hours of preparation and testing various combinations, we found one substance that elicited a reaction from the mycelium. They began to wither and lose their activity. Mary's joy was immense, and she immediately began preparing the maximum dose of this substance. For this purpose, she chose the largest syringe she could find and prepared the solution at the required concentration. We understood that we had to not only penetrate back into the cave and deliver the syringe to the core, but also do it as discreetly as possible to avoid attracting the attention of the werewolves. The preparation was complete. Now we needed to decide when we would get there. I decided to infiltrate the cave under the cover of night, when the town was shrouded in darkness and the werewolves, as supposed, left their posts at the core in search of prey. Mary played a key role in this, she distracted the elder under the pretext of urgent medical assistance, which gave me the opportunity to sneak into his residence unnoticed during the day. I found an old chest of drawers, where I decided to wait until nightfall. When midnight struck, I cautiously emerged from my hiding place, and making sure no one was nearby, headed for the basement. Adrenaline rushed through my heart at the realization that the upcoming actions could change everything. Entering the cave, I found that the scene remained unchanged. The brain still pulsated with different colors, creating a hypnotic spectacle. However, to my horror, not all the cocoons turned out to be empty. In one of them, a werewolf still slept, significantly complicating the task. I froze in place, trying not to make a sound to avoid waking the creature. A thought flashed through my mind, lightning fast, about how to proceed. I decided to take a risk and slowly move towards the brain when suddenly I heard footsteps. Behind me stood the Elder, and when I turned around, his calm gaze caught me off guard. He showed no aggression, but instead approached me, circled around and stood next to the brain. His words sounded calm, but there was depth in his knowledge of what lay before us. You managed to find this place after all, he began. When I saw you, I immediately understood that you were sharp. Are you curious about what this creature is? I don't know how it came to Earth, but perhaps it has always been here. It feeds on our emotions. I don't know how it works, maybe we emit some kind of energy. But for it, that's food. If you pay attention, it shimmers with different colors. Each color represents some emotion. Its favorite emotion, or the favorite emotion it likes to consume, is fear. So it created or perhaps simply made a deal with these creatures, which also serve as its guardians and those who instill terror in people. When I arrived here for the first time, it was just a vacant lot, and passing by, I accidentally discovered this creature. It enchanted me. Wait, you say that when you came here for the first time, there was a vacant lot. How old are you and who are you? I asked puzzled, who am I? I am the founder of this town, Kevin Horton. That's what they used to call me. In exchange for cooperation, this creature gave me longevity and immortality. My task was to provide it with food. 
In fact, although it may seem unbelievable, but people here have never suffered from lack. This creature, it provided them with food, never harmed. True, there was one incident when one of the workers accidentally wandered into this basement. As the guardian of this secret, I had to intervene. I myself was not comfortable with that incident. But what can you do? History has a way of repeating itself. Unfortunately, now we have to get rid of you too. After these words, filled with the cold acceptance of the inevitable, it became clear to me that the situation had turned in the most dangerous way. In fear, I looked around, and my worst fears were confirmed. The werewolf, which until that moment seemed to be sleeping in one of the cocoons, suddenly opened its eyes. Facing the elder, I searched for a way out of this extremely dangerous situation. Regardless of what you say, this place is nothing but a prison, and no good intentions will change that, I said, trying to distract him and simultaneously quietly approach. My words were meant to make him think, even for a moment. However, the elder, Kevin Horton, was too experienced to fall for such a simple trick. He quickly recognized my intentions and ordered the werewolf to attack. At that moment, when the werewolf leaped out of the cocoon at a frenzied speed, I, using the last spark of ingenuity, leaped to the elder and used him as a living shield. The werewolf, unable to stop, sank its teeth into him, tearing his throat. Blood spurted like a fountain, coloring everything around in red. Using the moment of confusion, I quickly pulled out the syringe with the solution and plunged it directly into the brain. Suddenly, the cave was engulfed in an earthquake, and the brain began to glow with all the colors of the rainbow, as if reflecting the last burst of its existence. A powerful surge of energy threw me several meters back, and I found myself in the air. The next thing I felt was a deafening explosion that rolled through the entire cave, and I was thrown even further from the epicenter of destruction. At the moment when I landed, the world around fell silent, and I lost consciousness, unaware of the consequences my actions would bring to the city and its residents. Regaining consciousness, I found myself in the infirmary, surrounded by the caring faces of Mary, her daughter, as well as Thomas and Sarah. In their eyes, I saw relief mixed with concern. They were waiting for the moment when I woke up to tell them about the events of the past night. At night, we heard an explosion and felt an earthquake, Mary began, her voice trembling with excitement. When we looked out the window, we saw how the werewolves, they withered, just like plants, and it happened with incredible speed. According to her, after it became clear that the threat had passed, they, together with their friends, decided to head towards the cave to find out what had happened. There, they found me unconscious, after which they immediately transferred me to the infirmary. Listening to their account, I realized that my risky attempt to destroy the Corps had been successful. The destruction of the Corps led to the werewolves seemingly losing their strength and life energy, which caused their instant withering. This was evidence that the Corps indeed controlled them, and fed on the emotions of fear they instilled among the town's residents. Relief that the threat had been neutralized mixed with a feeling of deep exhaustion. But at the same time, I felt gratitude towards these people who had not abandoned me in trouble and saved my life. Supported by Mary and Thomas, I slowly got to my feet, feeling relieved that I had no serious injuries. Fate had been merciful to me that night. Exiting the infirmary, I was met with an unexpected sight. A crowd of residents had gathered at its doors, awaiting news of what had happened. And when I appeared at the threshold, the first applause rang out in the air. Soon these sounds merged into a unified rhythm of applause and gratitude. 
I felt embarrassed by such attention as I did not feel like a hero. I just did what I thought was necessary. Passing through the crowd, I was led to the places where the werewolves used to dwell. In their place now lay only black spots on the ground, the last evidence that creatures once existed here, feeding on fear throughout the settlement. Similar traces left by the remnants of the brain were visible all over the city. My first and foremost desire after all that had happened was to leave this town forever. We headed to my truck, which the townspeople had managed to repair somehow. True, the windshield was lost, and instead, a makeshift small window was installed, and the remaining damage was covered with planks. Starting the engine, I felt the car come alive under my hands. Mary and her daughter sat next to me, and the other townspeople got into the trailer. We slowly set off, driving past the town that had been my home and prison for so many months. Casting one last glance at it, I firmly resolved that I never wanted to return here. Soon we hit the highway, where the ill-fated forest began. Driving through the forest, I keenly realized that every meter that took us away from the town brought us closer to freedom. The forest seemed to stretch endlessly, but ultimately it ended, and there were no signs of the city ahead of us. With relief, I sighed, realizing that we had finally managed to escape the trap.